Welcome to Never Rewrite. <laughs> <laughs> you forgot who you are again. <laughs> that we should just leave this in as a reoccurring thing. Yeah. Isaac forgets who he is. No, 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 script, cuss, no edits. Welcome to Never Rewrite. I'm Isaac Askew. And I'm Jeffrey Sherman. And today we are joined by special guest Thomas Morris, or Timo, uh, and he's going to discuss uh, company culture with us. So Thomas, or Timo, uh, take it away. Tell us who you are. Uh, give the audience a little bit of knowledge about who you are and what you yeah, do. Yeah, totally. Um, my name is Thomas Morris, as Jeffrey uh, alluded to. Um, Timo is my alias. <laughs> Been following me since college, so Timo's a lot easier, and people like that. Uh, nomenclature I have, so people just stick with it. Um, been a developer for nine plus years. Um, been an individual contributor, manager. Um, had my shot as a potential VP, um, but that kind of went belly up. So um, that's gonna. I'm gonna dive into that a little bit more when I speak about culture. But uh, yeah, that's in essence about what I do. Um, I would consider myself a full stack developer. Um, a polyglot. I love working in Java. <laughs> Me and Isaac have uh, different opinions about Java, but <laughs> yeah. uh, I love Java. I, I got <laughs> more than a decade experience coding in Java. Oh my yeah. god! Oh, that, you know what? I would love to learn from you because I talked um, to someone from at the campaign. I think you know Mark uh, Nutzel. I think Mark Nuttle, Yeah, Nuttle. And he basically um, blew me away with his expertise in Java. So I have a lot to learn. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure you're on the same level as him uh, in terms of like your Java expertise. I don't actually uh, hate Java. I just, uh, I've seen people abuse it so much that it, it made it hard for me to work in. So <laughs> that was fine. Uh, well, Java is just a, it's, a, it's an everything language. It's a Swiss army knife. Uh, and so I'm, my experiences are entirely unlike Marx. Marx is the enterprise. Mm. Uh, and my experience was in the low latency, high performance side. So yep. it, mm -hmm. just a total, you know, it, it's like any kind of a sandbox. You could build, do lots and lots of different things. So it's, oh, yeah. it's always interesting to see how somebody can have so much experience and have done nothing at all like you've ever done. <laughs> that's, um, that's how I feel. <laughs> but yeah. So some <clears throat> some context for this uh, this episode. Uh, we had a recent episode where we talked about uh, company culture, um, different teams, how to make teams thrive, how to kill a team, uh, things like that. And then <clears throat> Timo listened to some of those episodes, and uh, then we had some discussions offline about them. And so company culture is very important to him. So we thought we'd invite him on and kind of give him a chance to either comment on those prior episodes or... Uh, give some more color on like some of the passion he has around about good company culture. So Timo, uh, why is company culture important? What does it mean to you? Yeah. So um, if if you ever looked at my LinkedIn, so I worked at my first job out of college was, or uh, into development was, um, was a company called ThoughtWorks. So that was a consulting company where you went to different clients and different clients had different tech stacks. They had different um, domain business uh, focus or core business logic. Um, they had different teams, everything basically. And that in, in the time with that is going to be different cultures. So that was my first experience with actually bouncing from team to team and seeing different uh, cultures. Like one of the cool things, uh, the first actual um, platform I got to work on was something called Friends of the Congo. Um, and I think it'd be fine if I mentioned their, <laughs> their name, um, yeah, sure. but but yeah, I could only say good things about this uh, company. It's a nonprofit. Um, actually, this one thing I would want, I would want, I would want to shout out um, um, as a nonprofit because they, they are basically trying to give more transparency to what was going on in uh, the Dominican Republic of Congo. And so, and um, I don't know, do you by chance send links out or to attach links to the episodes? We have links to the episodes. You can yeah, yeah. share them after. Okay, perfect. I'll, I could, uh, Isaac or Jeff, I could send you both a link um, to a video that basically um, summarizes better than I can about what the mission of the company is, if, you, if anyone's interested. But yeah, that was yeah. my first actual project. It was a pro bono project that um, ThoughtWorks basically sponsored and paid for. Uh, so they, 
just the opportunity to like work on something like that that actually gives transparency to the atrocities that happen in the Congo to in the Congo and to the Congolese people and mm -hmm. give voice to that. That I mean for me, that was the biggest impact I had. And that wasn't so much culture. It was just like giving back to a mission or giving back to an organization that actually was improving the world. And to me, I never thought a company so all the companies I work for never are gonna reach that peak in terms of like the giving giving me um like the the i guess the what's the one I'm looking for the passion to actually build something that actually matters right like mm -hmm. it's hard to pull that out if you work in like a finance company or if you work at a banking company it's hard to pull that out of people but one thing i learned about when i'm working in different companies is the leadership can elicit their reaction even if the platform might not be that impactful to you so I, that's where culture oh sorry Oh, well, I was going to go with, I, so I started my career uh, in a finance company and our CEO was actually amazing. Like I didn't, it was my first job, so I didn't realize it, but he was amazing because he made us passionate about the company's mission, even though literally we were a, basically a stock exchange and our mission was to yeah. make it easier to buy and sell stocks. But he, he got us passionate. He got us riled up about the mission. Uh, and yeah, the, you will it is hard to beat that when you have a mission and you're changing the world and you believe it. Oh. Mm -hmm. And in our case, That's... we did, we changed the world and it, it turned out that when we did all those things, it was actually worse, <laughs> 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 but, but we changed the world and we did all the things that he said we were going to do. <laughs> it's, it's the ironic sense, right? You're driven <laughs> to do malicious things. <laughs> Well, it wasn't. It just it the the side effects. The right, right. The the short term things were all better in all the ways that we expected, and then sort of the long term. Anyway, but I, I'm I'm stealing your thunder. Go on. No, 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 no. I'm all, I'm actually pretty curious about that. Like, what made the like? And I, I guess um to, to ask you a question, what made yeah. you feel like the CEO or your leadership like elicited that reaction from y'all to actually feel like, hey, we're actually doing something that's mean I, i'm gonna say meaningful but the mission i can get behind the mission because the leadership's um um like uh ethos or his personality or his or her personality okay uh this is gonna get a little bit technical so <laughs> bear with me because i have to lay it out oh good <laughs> this is uh 2000 and stocks were still traded in fractions because stocks were still mm -hmm. primarily traded by humans waving fingers at each other as fast as they can so the the smallest amount the tick would be 164th which isn't even a, a whole number mm -hmm. and there'd be a 30 second delay uh because you have to give the humans time so you'd say i want to buy this and the, there'd be a minimum thing and there's a whole pile of literature and theory about how stock exchange like the, the pits which are all closed now, but like when you had the back in the, if you watch any like Wall Street movies in the eighties, you know, is the pits, there's the guys in the jacket and they're all waving their fingers and go rah, 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 and yelling at each other. And it's not that they were rigged. Uh, it's that they were set up in such a way that the pit traders were more or less guaranteed to make money with the idea being by, they had certain obligations and it was, as long as they could do a decent job, they were going to make money. And because they were going to make money, they would be honest and they would do their job, which yep. if you've got any idea about watching a Wall Street movie from the 80s, you can know is a pile of crap uh, <laughs> that just because they're guaranteed to make money doesn't mean they're going to be honest. Yep. And we were an electronic trading company or we were an electronic exchange. So when you wanted to buy or sell a stock, if you went through the humans, they had up to 30 seconds to execute your trade. And the minimum tick would generally be 164th, which is like uh, one and a half cents, basically. Yep. And what they would do something like 70% of the time is they would front run you, which means that they would trade on their own account ahead of you and then execute your order. Uh -huh. So that you ended up paying more or your sale would be less. And then they would take, so they would not only take the commission off doing the thing that they're obligated to do, but they would also cut you out. They would cut out much of your profits yep and we were electronic we had a computer and the computer was going to be honest 
because we programmed it and it was audited. <laughs> and almost more importantly, or actually more importantly, as we learned, the computer was going to execute in sub-second time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so like the analogy that our CEO used to use a lot was like, look, if you're trying to buy concert tickets and I can tell you in 30 seconds whether or not you bought the concert tickets for 20 bucks or I can tell you in under a second. Or uh, sorry, whether or not you got the tickets in th for 20 bucks and if you didn't get the tickets, it's now sold out. And you don't get tickets. Exactly. Or I can tell you in under a second if you bought the, you got the tickets, but you're going to have to pay $21. And if you didn't get them, you've got another shot because it's not sold out yet. And if mm. and his thing was like, look, if people want to pay the pay a little bit more yeah. for the certainty, for the speed, then that's their business. Uh, and because we were trading in decimals, well, we weren't trading in decimals because it wasn't allowed. But basically, we were trading in decimals and converting uh, and mm -hmm. we were trading in sub pennies. So if you've got something like back then Microsoft at hundred dollars, we would trade mm -hmm. Microsoft out to four set four decimal places. So sub sub penny, mm -hmm. the traders would be making pay one sixty four, so a tick. Uh, and so our whole mission was, hey, we're going to do these trades faster and fairer and cheaper, and this is going to be good for people. So this is right at the beginning of the E trade and the Day Tech. This company was actually a, a spinoff of Day Tech. Yep. And so we were doing that and that's, we did, we changed it. We pushed, you know, we helped push through. We got the trading from fractions to decimal. We got sub penny, but then the, the SEC made us walk it back. Uh, we changed the, the trading hours. So we had before and after hours trading. Uh, and the, the big thing we had is the sub second trading times. Mm -hmm. And so like our thought, our, our mission was that is all going to be really good for the consumer. The average person is going to be able to buy and sell stocks cheaper, right. so they're going to get be more profitable for them, and that's going to be good for everyone. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and you, you pretty much cut out the the I guess the pit at that point. Like they don't they're not useful anymore because now you know, you're still charging. I wouldn't even say you're still charging a premium. But like it's cheaper to go your route, and you're making money from it rather than using the pit. And they're already using um, like scummy tactics to cut off profits from the customer at that point. Right. Exactly. So. That was the idea was, okay, we're going to make the world much better. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of the the flip side of that, the unintentional thing is we we created high frequency trading, uh, which crashed the market a few times. <laughs> uh, is this related it, to Bernie Madoff? I feel like he did something like <laughs> No, no, like Bernie Madoff trading. was just a straight up Ponzi scheme. No, uh, I mean, like he, he got, uh, he, he helped uh, with like electronics in the, the stock market. Remember he like, his name like oh yeah, yeah he he was in favor of it, but but the the scam yeah. that Bernie Madoff was behind he he was just a straight up Ponzi scheme he wasn't doing any trade. <laughs> well, I mean like the the kind of work that you're doing was the kind of work he had developers doing too to help the trades I think yeah from what I remember. Yeah, he claimed he was, but he he wasn't actually doing. He that. claimed he was. <laughs> all right. Anyway, uh, okay, so let's walk all this back. So yeah. uh, Timo is happy with ThoughtWorks because they give him the ability to work towards a mission. Um, uh, kind of like highlighting the atrocities in Congo that were happening at the time or had, mm -hmm. had happened. Uh, and then we have Jeffrey talking about how he felt like he had a good mission too, mm -hmm. but it was just more of a perception of a good mission. It didn't end up, it, the after effects weren't as, as great, but all kind of in the same realm of like feeling like you're doing something good for the company and feeling like you have exactly. meaning and purpose. And so it sounds like mm -hmm. that's like, kind of like the main thread you're getting at here, uh, Timo, for as far as company culture. Yeah. And I think that's that's and from a leadership standpoint, that's um, I would say I want to know even how know how to portion this out for the culture because the culture is more than just the mission. It's um, it's the people you work with, the type of. So I remember this analogy that um, one of my buddies used to give for me with like culture. The bigger you get, the culture is like cement. The longer the uh, the company lasts, the harder it is to change the culture at that point. I've seen this in multiple companies where. And I worked at startups, I worked at established companies. So uh, established companies, it's like, you're basically, you could try to go against the grain. You can try to change the, you could try to change how people think. You could try to change leadership's mindset. But at that point, they already have a process in place. They already have the things they're used to. And I'm pretty sure both of you experienced it before, but if you try to change how someone operates that's been in the business for 20 years, it's, 
<laughs> it's like it's like pulling their teeth. You you mm -hmm. really can't change that person at that point because they already have it's basically they're coming for twenty years. They already established a pattern. They already established what they're comfortable with. Um, it's funny because it's even that's true even when the company knows that it's failing because it's exactly. got it's so high bound. You still can't exactly. change it. <laughs> exactly it's just like it's so stuck in the ways that it operates and the thing that that um i wouldn't even say this is culture thing but it's also with a lot of companies and leadership in general and my biggest pet peeve when it comes to leaders is ego ego and the inability to take feedback so i've worked at companies um where like you said you you become successful you 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 done something that got you to a certain point that's not enough to get to that next level you have to adapt to get to the next profit whatever you're looking for the next growth phase in the company the next profit phase in the company uh whatever that looks like you have to adapt to that point and to jeff to your point a lot of companies think like oh this what got me to being successful i'm going to stick with this because it led me to this point and it must work for all for all facets, like a, a one a one size fit all thing, and that's not entirely true all the time. Uh, could you go deeper into the you know leadership and ego? I'm curious, like what kind of terrible things have you seen or good things you've seen from egoless? <laughs> yeah, so um, not to again, not to call out names, but uh, no, no, no names. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's try to keep this as, uh, as anonymous as possible, but. Um, I've worked at companies change to protect the guilty. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I worked at companies in my in my career where it's it's so for me it's not so much so for me as a leader. Let me start with the definition of a leader. To me, uh, fits and it doesn't fit everyone's definition of a leader. But for me, it's someone who actually makes the lives of people who report to them easier. To me, that is a good leader. If you can make the lives of your employees easier in some facet. Then you're doing a good job, in my opinion. You're making and you and you and, and you're empathetic. So you let go of what you think is right, and you let go of what you assume is the best approach to a problem, and you listen to your employees. You listen to their feedback because they're the ones most like they're the, they're most like the ones who actually they're they're in the weeds of it. They experience it more than you do. Like yeah, you might have a high level understanding about how the company works, how things integrate, and how you have to communicate with different departments, but when it comes to people you manage, they have a much better insight at a low level about how things operate. And you need their insights into how to make things better. And so in order to make the, get those insights, you have to build that trust relationship and also make it easy for them to accomplish their, their mission or their goals to make the company better. So I've worked in, so that's my definition of leaders. So I've worked with leaders before that, that, rather, that they care more about being right than making a company um, succeed. Mm -hmm. And that is a dangerous presence to follow because it's not so much that they care about, hey, what is the best approach or what is the what is what is the best solution for the problem we're trying to accomplish? It's I it's my solution. So my solution is basically in etched in stone. I got to this position because I know best. And I work with people like that that would be would and, and the thing that the most jarring about it is that it's people who are not technical saying things that um, that are saying that this is the best solution for a technical standpoint, and they're not technical. I work with leaders like that. Yes, I know. I know. And, hey, can you give an example of some of the brilliant, brilliant leadership? Uh, if that doesn't reveal too much detail about some brilliant decisions that some of these people have made, because it sounds very Dilbert esque. Yeah. So it's it's the and this is where it comes for hubris. So for so for an example, and I'm I'm, I'm trying to keep this vague as possible. Uh, <laughs> so the example I can give is that they see other solutions that exist, and they use those solutions, external services, to solve very short term problems. Mm -hmm. And they assume that that same solution or similar solutions exist out in the ethos of the internet <laughs> or some service out there exists that will solve the team's internal problem from a technical standpoint. And they say, find that service that will solve our problems or mm -hmm. our, our company problems. And 
when you try to explain to them, hey, <laughs> like, sure, we can use this service, but it doesn't, it only hits on like 40% of the issues. The rest of it is, it has to be built in a house, it has to be customly made. Then it's a, well, that's not fast enough, or that's not quick enough, <laughs> or, or we need to be, we need to move because we don't have the time for it. And it's just like, well, I'm sorry, <laughs> but this is the reality we live in. And I wish there was and like, and, and, like, and again, I wish there was a solution that existed. I wish there was something that we could pull out the box and be like, solves all of our, our, all of our problems or build a product that makes us more efficient, but that doesn't exist. <laughs> so I'm I've, sorry. I've actually had clients or a, a client that's, and it's funny enough, we'll get back to that in a second that it has had uh, similar demands like this where they're like, they don't quite understand. They're like, oh, well, we want you to build this thing and we know this thing's out there already. Can't mm -hmm. you just, you know, use this currently existing thing uh, and use this currently existing thing too. And it's like a, kind of like a patchwork of all kinds of different services. They're like, oh, well, the solutions exist. So just, just use those. And you're like, well, to get those things talking to each other is a lot of work, right? Mm -hmm. so th that's coming just from a non-technical person who's like a client. Uh, the idea that you have somebody who's in a leadership position uh, is even scarier because of the client. You can say no <laughs> in leadership. You have to say yes a lot of times, or at least give it, give it your best effort for pushing back before they just say, well, we're doing it anyway. And that's the difficult part when it comes to it. And it gets to a certain point where you just, um, I can't remember. <laughs> I remember during the last episode, you all talked about with culture. There's a certain point you just don't listen to uh, certain people. You just have to block them out. And that's what we had. I mean, that's what I had to do with um, that leadership at the time. I was like, okay, I can't like you're not giving me like not even like clear. The, like, well, one part of it was not clear direction about where we were going, but it's also like you're not giving me helpful solutions or anything that's substantial that I can actually bite my teeth around. I understand what the product we need to build is I understand where we need to go for the company to succeed and what and there's no out of box solution for that. So I'm going to keep going on this path. Because hopefully, given the time, because I did have leeway to build out that technical implementation, hopefully, given the time, we can we can show you why what we're building is valuable. And that's where MVPs come from. That's where demos mm -hmm. come from. That's how showing them like everything we're building is actually bringing value. And it's done in it. And we did it in a timely fashion, too. Like we 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 beat out the es estimations around what the projected timeline was going to be to actually build out this MVP. We did that, but it still wasn't satisfactory enough. Right. It still was, and then at that point, you just like, <laughs> and that's where it's just like, where do we, where do we go from here? So, like, let, this this is super interesting to me. So, let me play devil's advocate. I'm going to be the clueless, arrogant leader thing for a moment. Uh, Timo, right? I, we could have bought this thing right for money, and mm -hmm. it would have gotten us halfway there. And instead, you guys developed which also cost me money because i paid you guys yeah. and you've got me an mvp which gets me you you know before you said that the the existing SaaS implementation would be like 40 or 50 percent how, how much mm -hmm. of the problem does the mvp solve does it actually does it solve anything or does it just show that we could solve it so and that's what the trade-off were so <laughs> If you were my, if you if you were the product owner or like not even product owner because product owners would understand how product works, but the but company owner, were, the company owner at that. My point, name's on the checks. <laughs> <laughs> A certain, respect my authority. Respect <laughs> my authority. <laughs> but at that point, you'd be like, all right, and, and the thing is, like, there's there's trade offs with that, and that's completely mm -hmm. fair. Like, what's the trade off if we get to the fifty percent mark? Is that 50% mark going to convert the amount of people that we expect to convert to use our platform or to get the get the business that we expect them to? If it if it doesn't, then you know what? And at that point, if you're like, okay, cool. If we have a 50% uh, solution that goes 50%, let's implement it. Let's use that solution for now. And then we have ways to actually vet out with data. Is this actually leading us to the right path? Is it actually leading us to where we want to expect the conversion of leads that we expect to get all these questions that need to be answered we can actually monitor that mm -hmm. if it doesn't then we can be like hey how and then the thing is like what's the turnaround point at that point where do we say stop and let's focus on all right let's build the mvp out and see if that extra at that 50 percent or whatever 
left that needs to be completed, how much of that can we get done and, and then test that to make sure that that MVP or what we build now actually converts what we, the conversion that we expect to get, get those answers up front. So in the scenario with the arrogant boss where you built the MVP, were you able to get far enough that you could actually get metrics and data about the usefulness of what you were building? So, you know, again, it's the road not taking, you never know if we'd implement, you know, if we paid for the SaaS and we think we'd have gotten 50%, but mm -hmm. they could get metrics and see how close the projections or, or the other road is build it yourself and get the metrics. Were you able to get far enough to get the metrics on the MVP? <sighs> we were able to get metrics about um it was giving us high conversion mm -hmm. um and we were able to show the bosses that but it wasn't at the rate that they expected it to or mm -hmm. at the numbers that they wanted to get it at at that point um i wish i could dive into it a little bit more but then it would be showing my hand about who the company is <laughs> okay fair enough fair enough let's <laughs> let, let's keep the guilty guilty or anonymous yeah. No. Just, there, there's nothing like angry arrogant people to want to fire off letters <laughs> i know they they i don't know if they, these these my bosses would be or at the time they would be upset about it um because honestly um i left on well um we left on good terms with the relationship um so um they don't i don't i don't know i don't i don't think they would be mad if they heard this podcast but again who knows no, I, I respect client confidentiality is if that's a thing that, you know, that, that if that was a thought works thing, then absolutely let's respect it and not, not blab. Yeah. So. So they're, they're an example of, uh, you're saying like the kind of the high ego thing with like, we found a solution out there. Why can't you build it our way or this easy way? Why is this going to take so long? Uh, and so they're just not able to relinquish, um, that kind of control or like respect the decisions of, of developers or something like that. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah. It's just, it's, it's, it's a mix of not respecting the developers. And then, so I've worked with, and then this is another thing that comes with your ego because you have to get your ego satiated by praise or accolades or something to basically make you feel like, Oh, I'm doing something. I'm, I'm bringing value. Right. Um, Cause it's not about the team at that point, about the individual, um, accomplishments so and to your point i work with uh leaders who are just like i need i don't like i don't care what you think or i don't <laughs> care about where you're coming from i care about am i the one who made the solution and like i'm pretty sure you both played this game with uh with leaders who have that mentality before where you have to basically make them think that hey, your idea is their idea <laughs> yes yes and it's just and it's just it's just very exhausting when you have to have that because it's just like all right how do i phrase this to this person where not only am i making them feel good about what they what they're what basically what they what they think came out of their mind but then <laughs> i also have to have to be able to let my own um ego or my own self-confidence go so whenever they say oh i came up with this idea it'd be like yeah you sure did boss Good job. Great, great <laughs> job, boss. You're doing great. What's funny about all that is as you move up in leadership, people who say stuff like that, everyone laughs at them because from a from like leadership's point of view, if I'm a manager, I get rated based on the success of my team. Exactly. Nobody cares right. about my ideas. It's I'm I'm, I'm managing. So if 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 my team is successful because I supported them and they come up with these great ideas, great. And if my mm -hmm. team is successful because I had the great ideas and I told them, well, now you can't promote me because uh, if you promote me, I'm not going to be there to give them all these great ideas anymore. Uh, and <laughs> no, it's yeah. true. It, it's yeah. true. It's it's well as if you're irreplaceable, you're also unpromotable. Mm -hmm. um, managers get credit for success. And so the any manager who's stealing the success of their employees is just cutting like they're cutting their nose to spite their face. They're they're taking they're getting credit for the wrong thing. You want to make yeah. yourself seem as a manager needs to view themselves as somebody who facilitates their team because they're getting credit for all the team success. 
right? Mm -hmm. If I've got five people and they are all doing awesome, that looks good on me. If I got five people and they're doing awesome because I'm telling them what to do, then I'm being a bad manager. I right. might still be successful and they'll leave me there, but mm -hmm. they're, they're not going to promote me because then I'm not going to be there. Like, who's going to tell my team what to do then? I, I follow your logic and reasoning. <laughs> However, <laughs> mm. <laughs> uh, not a lot of not all companies use logic and reasoning. And uh, there's definitely I, I, I know cases where people do, you know, cut their nose to spite their face and then get promoted. Right. You'd be amazed. Well, not amazed, but they, you can go a certain amount, but you can't get mm. you won't get the VP titles. <laughs> gotcha. Well, yeah, you might, but you won't <laughs> get it off the backs of taking credit for other people's work. I see. Yeah, I forgot the what's that prince? It's like a it's a term name where you it, you get promoted till you reach a certain point where now you're inefficient. I forgot the name. I forgot the, the term. Peter principle. The Peter you get principle. promoted to the level of your incompetence. Exactly, and yep, and <laughs> and I mean it shows a lot of companies like like um because some some people who are like fantastic developers like like some of the brightest developers I would work with would be terrible managers. And they have become managers or being in leadership roles and they and they just they don't know how to properly um augment their team that's what leadership management is you have to augment your team where mm -hmm. if i were so and this my this my this my thing whenever i become a when i was a manager or and or a potential vp of a company my mentality is that if if i were to leave the company the company should should be able to operate without me being there I mean, that sounds like a that sounds like an oxymoron, but it's not. I mm -hmm. should be able to, have, to be able to leave the company, and the company operates at just as well as if I was there, because I made the teams more efficient. I made I left I leave blocks out the way. Maybe they maybe they'll get um, bombarded by <laughs> by people who are now asking them questions or at the internal team where I was blocking things out initially. But my mm -hmm. team should be able to perform just as well as with me there as if I was not there. Right. A good manager basically manages themselves out of a job. Exactly. And that's how it should be. And that's people, true. and it's, it's an uncomfortable for some managers to think that because it's like, oh, then I'm not valuable. No, you are valuable because you made your team more efficient. And they will keep you around because once, I mean, and, and, and I'm kind of contradicting myself with this, but once you leave, like for the short term, everything's still fine. But if those above those leaders above who are like bombarding you with stuff you're blocking the team from now the team starts feeling and now you now the team will understand like oh that's why my manager was here to block me away from the bullshit at the end of the day mm -hmm. am i allowed to curse yeah, yeah. yes <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah, so the manager plays an important role and you can still leave but you still need a manager it's just that you've made the team uh, efficient um uh, and and you, your your presence will be felt when you left because there might be other teams that are either not not as efficient as the team that you led or the team kind of falls back on their old bad habits once you leave. You know, like, so exactly, I guess there is kind of a catch twenty two there, like an oxymoron kind of feel to it because um, mm -hmm. they might operate a little while <laughs> as if yeah, know, it's not forever. Somebody yeah. has to be managing because new new problems will arise. Exactly. Well, all right. So <clears throat> let's see. We we started with conversation on ThoughtWorks um, and how them they gave you the ability to to work towards a mission you felt was really important, and that kind of gave you meaning in your job. And then we kind of mm -hmm. skated around topics about like, I guess, partially going into the concept of bad company culture with with you know managers who have high egos or not like trying to help raise their team up or you mm -hmm. know make the team better. They're just kind of like. Almost kind of like last episode where we talked about somebody who's like, well, that's not the way I would do it. <laughs> uh, it's, it's like letting people find out their own, you know, letting people grow underneath them. Because if you keep yeah. giving people your own solutions, you're not letting people think for themselves and come up with their own solutions and, and grow. So mm -hmm. before we start wrapping this up, um, is there any kind of other message around like culture that you want to hit on before we, um, before we end today's uh, session? I think for me, I think the if I could wrap culture off in like a couple of words, it's it's whatever the company intentions are, whatever the company goals are. That's what the culture of the company is. Um, and I'll elaborate a little bit more on that. But 
um, you have cultures that are, I worked at cultures where <laughs> I remember, um, Isaac, you talked about this in one of your previous episodes about the, the grind culture, the hard, the hustle culture, mm -hmm. where every, the sales team is on the hustle. They always got to meet me numbers. They always got to be grinders. They always got to be getting on to the next level, um, where the tech team might not be that way. And it's, it's like, mm -hmm. all right, so why is that culture there? Because, well, the company incentivizes that. And so if you're going to incentivize that type of behavior, people are going to go with that type of behavior. Like this book I'm reading right now, Infectious Greed, um, mm -hmm. going back to the financial uh, markets. Um, it's a really good book um, um, by uh, Frank, Frank Partney. I can, sh I can show it if you're able to see it. Um, Blur, uh, it's getting blurred. Our, our <laughs> listeners also can't, <laughs> at least at least they heard the title. I thought we at least showed a book, but yeah. <laughs> um, it's called the Face Degree by uh, Frank Partnoy. Um, but it really talks about how uh, how basically the the um the parasite that occurred in one um investment company or basically one banking company, or even with uh, how CEOs get compensated with stock options like percolated throughout the entire industry because mm -hmm. it was easy ways to make money make money doing dubious um du dubious financial transactions such as derivative swaps um mm -hmm. or dubious uh, actions where uh, you have your ceo who doesn't care about how the stock perform for the long term because they have stock options all they care about is short-term gain so for them as long as the stock looks like it's doing well over time in the short term they make their money once the uh, once they can exercise their options where after all the scandals of things they've done in the past mm -hmm. start coming out and then they, the stock is not really worth or the company not really worth what the stock price is, then it just dips. So, but what caused that is you incentivize that in the culture. If you're gonna have that type of behavior and you're gonna pay people for that behavior or you make them get bonus or they get raises or move up in the company because of those um, behaviors, they will, they, will they will emulate that behavior because that's how you move up in the company. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, that's how your culture gets it gets created. So a lot of companies um, think that oh, we just like they use the term like family and yeah. <laughs> team, and, which is all sweet things to say, right? But it doesn't mean anything because this the company's action, not your family unless you exactly. come from a very bad family. <laughs> <laughs> like I, my dad never told me, you know what, son? It's hard. It's, we having hard financial times right now, so you have to leave. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Figure it out. Just <laughs> to leave the family. Just leave the family. Exactly. I'm so, it's just hard we, times. We, we've closed out. off. We, we've closed out. We, we've closed off one head count for sons right now. So <laughs> sorry. But but if we get some more money in the next six months, we'll, we'll recall you. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> once, we, once I get back on my feet, we, I'll, I'll give you a call, babe. Come right back to the house. <laughs> You can interview for your job back. Son. <laughs> Son, <yeah. laughs> the family thing gets Sorry. really the family thing gets really creepy. Um and, but also like it makes people think the same way. Uh, or I, I would I would imagine you have to be very careful because if you're firing people who are not fitting whatever you've defined your values are and hiring mm -hmm. people who are, uh, then you end up again, if you're not careful and you don't have like at least some diversity of those values, you're just going to be hiring the people who, who think and operate the same and firing anybody who thinks differently. Uh, so mm -hmm. I imagine your culture might get very boring over time unless you're very careful about uh, defining well, you end up with, values. You end up with a monoculture. Yeah, and exactly. monocultures are always less resilient than more dynamic ones. Yep. Yeah. 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 And it's funny because... um. I know we are up on time, but there's one example I had a previous company where someone actually got fired because they had a different opinion from the masses. And um, it's stuff like that, that, like you said, it's just like, well, if you want to talk about like diversity, inclusion and, uh, and equity at the company, well, that just, that doesn't just stop at like what your, what, you, what your skin tone is or what your ethnicity is or what uh, your sexuality is it also comes with like, well, how people think too. And we can't exclude that out too. Like different thoughts bring in different perspectives, but then bring in different ideas, which makes different solutions. Um, so yeah, I'm, and I, I'm, I'm not trying to make it sound like DEI is not useful because it's very extremely useful, but the inclusivity part of that also includes um, difference of opinions and difference of thought when it comes to different topics. Right, you want people in a room who don't think the same because if you all think the same, then you all have the same solution to the same problem and you might have a more creative one out there if you had somebody who had 
a completely different set of circumstances that led them to be a completely different person from a different culture from whatever um exactly. that diversity of thought diversity of thought is yeah i think very underappreciated mm -hmm. all right cool <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Timo, for hopping on and giving us some some insight into the things you find important in company cultures. Um, yeah, and if people uh, want to find out more about you, where should they look? Oh, yes. Um, so um, my LinkedIn, uh, you find me, my, my name is very generic. <laughs> uh, it's Thomas Morris uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, it's, you can it's put it in the show notes. Yeah, I'll put it in the show notes. And then my email is morenaruto007 at gmail.com. As you can tell, I'm a big uh, anime fan. So that's a, that's a classic, uh, <laughs> classic name from the older years. <laughs> I know. Love it. Naruto is still one of my top anime of all time. So, <laughs> all, right. all right. Cool. Well, thank you for listening. I'm Jeffrey Sherman. And I'm Isaac Askew. And this is Never Rewrite.